Evolution of the CRISP Research Initiative, presented by Dr. Ross Martin and Andy Hanks. Hello, my name is Ross Martin. I am the Program Director of the CRISP Research Initiative at CRISP, and I'm going to be speaking with you today about the evolution of the CRISP Research Initiative, and I'm joined today by Mr. Andy Hanks, a uh, project consultant at CRISP, who is working on our new cloud-based uh, analytics platform called CRISP Insights. So we are going to run through a lot of information about how we're creating the ability for clinicians and uh, academic researchers to have access to CRISP mediated data so that they can uh, contribute to the learning health system in the United States and the world. And we are a couple of years into this, and I'm going to give you a big bit of an overview of it. And then we'll uh, uh, talk a lot about where we're going from here with the new platform that we have available. So with no further ado, let's get into it. Let's dig. So for the purposes of this conversation, CRISP, um, if you're familiar with this at all beyond uh, because of you've been going to all these uh, sessions for this seminar for our symposium, you know that we do more than just Maryland and DC, but for the purposes of research use case, we are currently limited to just doing this within Maryland and DC. We also, of course, service West Virginia. We're doing some new things with the state of Connecticut and, and other regions are starting to use other parts of our applications uh, and services, but we are still uh, just doing this within Maryland and DC. And that may change over time. I wanted to remind everyone of the principles that guide the overall mission of CRISP. And a couple of things that are highlighted here are about how we use information technology to do collaborative things. And for research, this is a, a great opportunity for us to bring together a lot of data that would otherwise be very difficult for people to do. But we also have a, a principle of doing things with manageable scope and remaining incremental. And that's also been a hallmark of how we've grown this since we started it in 2016. Um, we, it's, we, are not, we, we are never trying to compete with our participants. We are always, we, so we don't do the research ourselves, for example, we are making data available to them. I just wanted to point out those uh, particular features within our uh, CRISP, overall CRISP ethos. We have uh, several guiding principles a lot that are aligned with those overarching principles that drive how we have approached the uh, building a function within CRISP that will support um, re researchers to give them access to data. One is understanding that this function, while it's very important, and if you think about the long-term impacts of making data available to for research, to build the learning health system, to really understand, to get that feedback loop to really happen, it's always going to be a secondary use within CRISP. So for example, just as we built this out, there have been a lot of projects and things that were possible and feasible that we could do in research, but we had to wait until um, it was a core part of what we were doing as CRISP as a whole for the primary use of patient care, uh, population health, uh, changing immediate outcomes. So we were always sort of taking a back seat to that appropriately. So it's not, it's not because we, it's not important. It's because we have to have the primary, the prime directive, if you will, lead us. So we are going to contribute to this by making these data available to research through a well-governed process that's carefully audited. We are taking this in incremental uh, steps. Um, we wanna make sure that researchers are not getting access to their own data by bypassing their institutional processes by going through CRISP. That's another thing that we've tried to avoid. We don't want to take the place of the institutional review board at a, at a research facility, at a, at a clinical institution. So, Another thing just to keep in mind is that um, this project is really one of the only ones that CRISP does that is kind of a retail project. And what I mean by that is we actually charge per study that we support. I have to um, do a cost analysis of what it's going to take for us to do that. Now, as we've gotten along, we've been able to do this much more efficiently, but there are still some administrative costs of getting you know, the data use agreements all together and then just giving people access to the different types of data. And that has, cost, but we are doing that in a cost recovery manner. So we're only making the data um, 
uh, we're not charging, we're not, we're not making any money off of this. And even, even now, even as we have continued to grow the program, we're not quite breaking even, if you will, but that's okay. We're, we're trying to really hit that number of breaking even. We're uh, making sure that, that people know that we're doing this. So information about the research program is on our website. We try to be very transparent about what types of programs that we're supporting. And it's always got to be in the public good. It, it can't be just something that's that's because somebody thinks it would be interesting or they might make money off of it or something like that. We, it's, it's all about uh, the public good. We're really trying to make sure that we get feedback on the data service quality and, and incorporate whatever we find in terms of results and, and findings into our offerings in the future. And then we're just trying to make sure that we can do this in an optimal manner, um, uh, trying to um, figure out ways to do this more efficiently. And with the Crisp Insights platform that Andy's gonna be talking about, I think this is a great example of how we're evolving to support uh, new uses. So if you think about the timeline of, of how we've been doing this so far, we started off in, in 2016 when we first got regulatory approval from the state of Maryland to be able to, as a uh, designated uh, HIE for Maryland, uh, we were permitted to use uh, research as a, as a use case. Initially, it was not a use case. And if you think about that, we, we didn't wanna lead with using data for anything other than clinical care. And so that was always the hallmark of what we do and it will continue to be. So that's why this was, whoops, excuse me. That's why this was a little bit later. Um, then once we got the state regulatory framework for supporting it, um, we also had to put together a research subcommittee that reports to our clinical committee to uh, figure that out. We also had to, one of the very first things we did right after regulatory approval was getting our participation agreement to have this new use built into it. So we had to make a, a material amendment to our uh, participation agreement. Our first use cases were approved in 2016, late, late in the year, and that was for patient consented IRB approved research. So the, the basic use was just, you've got patient that says, yes, you can look at my data for research, then we would give you access to the same kinds of tools that our clinicians have. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We supported our first study in also in late 2016. And since that time, we've added new use cases, new different ways that you can access our data. And uh, today we've, we've, we've supported over 20 studies that are either approved and live or completed uh, and no longer, you know, they're finished. And so we've been able to move from those. So it's, it's, it was a slow start, but we've uh, gotten a lot of momentum in the last year or so. This is, you know, CRISP's um, operations all rely on a lot of regulations and laws that are governing how we do work, work and research is no exception. We have, uh, of course, uh, HIPAA 42 CFR Part 2, which is um, uh, more about the um, uh, uh, substance abuse treatment uh, rules. Then there are lots of other um, things that are specific about research, especially uh, under the HIPAA safe harbor rule, for example, for uh, research uses. Um, we also have an opt-out function for, um, for patients who are getting access to our data. And I want to just point that out. We are, of course, an opt-out state, um, uh, which means that, that you are, your data flows through CRISP unless you specifically opt out of it. But if you do opt out of CRISP in that full opt-out way, researchers won't be able to see your data because we won't have it. And, and that's just something to keep in mind. And, and it, I'll get back to the opt-out function in, uh, later on in the talk. So we spent about six months putting together this data use agreement, uh, talking to a lot of lawyers, working uh, uh, in a lot of detail. It's kind of long, but it, it really is the, um, is the mechanism by which we can have legal ground to share the data that's coming from lots of different inst institutions. And that, that data use agreement points back to our participation agreement. So one of the important aspects of this, just as you're thinking about, well, how you know, could I do research with CRISP data? You must be a participant in CRISP in order to have access to our data. You cannot do this um, uh, as an external entity. That said, if you are an external entity, uh, maybe a, a research consortium, um, we haven't done any commercial studies yet, but th there's no, rule that says we couldn't do some in the, do so in the future. So if a pharmaceutical company or a device manufacturer wanted to do a study, 
um, they could support a study from one of our participating organizations, but they couldn't, they couldn't lead it themselves. They couldn't do the data request themselves. As I mentioned earlier, we, we have a research subcommittee. I'm, I really am very pleased with the dedication of the folks who have committed time to helping us navigate this kind of complex subject and mature it over time and make some really thoughtful decisions about how we're going to grow. And while these, for the most part, these are all folks that have a, a research bent of some sort. Shanna Koss, for example, is a consumer advocate and we literally hired her. Um, we, we do pay for her time because she's the only one on the, on the committee that doesn't have a you know, direct stake in the game of how we do this. So we wanted to make sure that we had good consumer representation on the, on the subcommittee. And the others um, really are thoughtful about making sure that we do this in an incremental and appropriate fashion. If you think about all the core services that we provide, and this is just, this is not about research, this is just about the stuff that we do as CRISP. We provide a lot of point of care information that goes into uh, clinical, uh, uh, clinical encounters. We provide information about uh, those encounters so to help with care coordination. We do a lot of reporting services and public health support, and then we have administrative data. All of those things are potentially of use in research in different ways. And so we've really tried to tap into those. And specifically the ADTs, the admission discharge transfer messages that we get that's, that drive the encounter notification service, um, those are very useful in understanding um, where people have shown up, especially if we're looking at things beyond just the hospital setting where our, the data we get from the state, the case mix data that I'll get into in a bit, um, those data are really helpful for hospitalizations and emergency room visits uh, uh, and observational visits to the hospital, but don't really talk about things like long-term care and um, uh, private practices and things like that. And those ADT messages that we get from lots of places are very helpful for that. But the real link to all of this and way, the way our research work can can happen is because of our master patient index that we can connect data sets from different institutions on the same patients. And that's in, in incredibly powerful for this. We also leverage the provider, provider panels. So if you're doing a consented study, for example, you would submit to us a panel of your patients and it's based on that, uh, that set of patients, that's what you're gonna get access to in the query portal, or that's what, you're gonna, that's what we're gonna send you um, in counter notification service messages, ENS uh, messages uh, to you based on that provider panel, just like we would for a, pr a private doctor's office. Um, increasingly, our, the registry data and the reporting data that we do are being uh, leveraged to do research as well, and I'll get into that in ju just a little bit. I wanted to make one point about the difference between research and quality improvement. It's, it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a subtlety, but we, we um, generally define research as, are you going to make generalizable knowledge? And this is one of the concepts that drive the demarcation between an internal quality improvement project, which, is, which is, does not require specific approval from CRISP, and we don't charge you for that. That's part of your, if you have access to the data, you can do quality improvement programs. We do ask that for, for quality improvement, that you do report to us, especially if it's not a clinician doing those studies, because we have an audit process. And if you're looking up a bunch of patients that don't appear to be your patients, it may um, set off flags and stuff like that. So we do wanna know that you're doing a quality improvement program so we don't restrict your access to the data uh, inappropriately. Um, so if you're doing QI, you would submit, there's stuff on our website about how you do that. But the research stuff is if you're trying to publish a paper basically, or present in a public forum and, and share data about and share your results from that, that's when you cross over into the research realm. So I mentioned a couple of the use cases that we've supported so far that the IRB approved consented research. Initially, that was the only one we had and it was kind of the core of what we were doing. We were giving people access to the data, but also, we support, um, as you may know from some of the other, uh, from your experience with CRISP or from some of the other uh, presentations that you've seen, we support the HSCRC, the Health Services Cost Review Commission, part of the Maryland Department of Health. And they, they have a, a well curated data set called Case Mix that they use um, to uh, 
manage how this you know, total cost of care model that, that is, is now uh, driving a lot of the way um, hospitals in, the, in Maryland get paid. I'm not, this is not a talk about the case mix data and the, and the whole, um, what used to be um, uh, the, the, um, the waiver, if you will. But uh, hospitals get paid differently in Maryland. And because of that, they submit a lot of data to the state. Those data are highly curated. They are very effective. We help manage them and we, we append them with our master patient index identifier, our CRISP ID, if you will, so that we can match them across institutions. And so all 47 acute care hospitals in Maryland contribute to this data set. And, they, and we help manage that data for a lot of reporting. And we also do that for research. The, the caveat with that is you have to request it both from CRISP and from HSCRC, but we've been making this easier and easier, uh, trying to lessen the administrative burden of doing those requests and speeding it up as well. Um, so if you're doing a standard re uh, uh, request, we can do that fairly quickly. We kind of took that same idea of using these external data sets like the HSCRC case mix data and where we could also put geocodes, meaning a, an identifier that says what a, a, an approximate location for someone, but not so granular that you wouldn't know where they lived. So like a census block or a census group um, level of geocode can be appended to those data. We, we also said if, if another data provider, let's say another part of the, the state of Maryland or um, uh, another institution that has data and they give permission for it to be used in the CRISP setting, we can match it to our patient ID and combine those data sets and produce a de-identified um, data set um, or, or excuse me, a, a limited data set, which was partially de-identified. So we remove the regular identifiers from it. We may leave in something like year of birth and gender, which is considered um, uh, personal health information, but we would extract other, other types of identifiers that you wouldn't be able to re-identify that person and you're actually prohibited based on our data use agreement from doing that as well. So that um, we've, we've had that, uh, or that, that use case going on for a couple of years now. And then we added one last year for just administrative data. There was an interest in trying to find out, for example, if a, if a study of, uh, of a training study to say, okay, we, we gave a bunch of doctors um, uh, training on how to use the prescription drug monitoring program site and on CRISP. We wanted to see if they started using it more. Well, that's not PHI. It's not provider data. It's just administrative data. And we, we don't even have to get um, the research subcommittee to approve those requests. I can, I can do that just as the program director. And finally, the one that I'm really most excited about, because this is one that researchers have been asking for for a long time, is to be able to create data sets. Now, historically, we've had a hard time doing that because our data, you know, think of CRISP more like plumbing than like um, a data lake. We, we move data around and often it's in document form and we haven't spent historically a lot of time getting those data in a, um, in a very pristine format so that you could compare apples to apples. We just moved as much data as we could, but we're starting to change that. And that's what, what Andy's really going to talk about are some of the... Um, real advances that we're making in, in cloud computing so that we can create data sets. I'm gonna get into a little, little bit more in, um, on that in a minute before, before we get back to, um, uh, before Andy talks a lot about it. So this is an example of, of the studies that have been approved so far under the first use case of consented IRB approved research. Um, this has been a real, uh, a real boon. And just frankly, you know, the, the, what they'll do is they'll be just like a user of CRISP, they'll go to the, uh, unified landing page and they'll look up their patients and they'll um, uh, get the data delivered. This has had, even though that um, it's still kind of cumbersome for them if they've got a large uh, patient set, they've benefited greatly from having these, um, these data available. They are, um, uh, in this, this next slide really talks about a paper that's out for publication. It's been approved, but it hasn't been released just yet. Um, where one of our early studies, they happened to be in midstream when they started this study, when they started using CRISP for the study. So they were able to look at how they were doing historically, how they had been talking to patients to get their histories every six months, 
and getting, you know, finding out where they'd been hospitalized and what, where they had gone to see the doctor. And then they got CRISP data and they were able to um, have a huge jump in the number of encounters that were documented in CRISP that were undisclosed any other way. And these methods that they were using were very well-established techniques to get um, you know, self-reports on hospitalizations. Now, granted, this patient population happened to be a fairly uh, challenging one. They, were, uh, they had a history of substance abuse and they had chronic illnesses and they were being given patient navigators and that, that was the nature of the study, but they did this other study on, on the effect of CRISP. So it is really valuable to have access to this. It's not a surprise, but it was really nice. To, we had a happy accident of being able to actually show this in a data and in, in prove it. Um, so then uh, I mentioned the case mix data quite a bit. We've had, um, at first we started off with a lot of these uh, consented studies, but lately lot, lots more people have wanted the case mix data. Again, because especially if you're trying to figure out what's the clinical impact of something, well, you want to know, did they go to the hospital? Did they um, get a uh, procedure done? And all of, uh, and what were their diagnoses? And the case mix data has all of that. And we can deliver that very easily. If you just give me um, a patient identifier for your hospital um, or your clinic, I can produce for you a very clean set of data in a matter of, you know, in, in a very short amount of time. It doesn't, because this, this, these reports got built for other, other purposes. And uh, we were able to leverage them again for research secondarily to the, their initial purpose for uh, population health. And then finally, we've had a few of these other use cases um, being leveraged including most recently the, the newest one that just, even though it was approved about a year ago, we didn't launch it until recently because we didn't have this uh, more granular opt-out function in play. And that's what I wanna get to um, as I start turning it over to Andy here. We spent uh, quite a bit of time adding in a new research only opt-out function for um, CRISP. So to now today, as of last month, if a patient says, I wanna opt out of CRISP when they go to our website or they get a download a form to fill out or call us up, they also have the option to say, I just, wanna, I just don't want somebody using my data for research. I still want my doctors to see my data, um, but, but not for research. And we were not gonna, even though we had this use case approved, it was not gonna be available for use until we had that opt out function in place. And that fortunately finally happened um, last month. So we now have the ability to create limited data sets under HIPAA Safe Harbor and leverage what Andy's gonna talk about next. And this study um, one, that he's gonna talk about more was, was the uh, effort that we, we paired up with uh, Johns Hopkins University to say, a lot of people are gonna wanna do research on COVID. So let's create a, a Research, comp research compatible data set using a, a function called OMOP or a, a, a data architecture called OMOP that is commonly used in, in research data sets. And we are delivering data to the Hopkins team who is very well versed in OMOP, which CRISP is not, um, and, and we're making it available to them through our uh, CRISP Insights platform. And this is, the, the primary aim is to try to look at um, you know, what's been happening to uh, these clinical predictors of uh, hospitalization, of ICU, ventilator, and, and death uh, with this. But it's also to make sure that if other researchers in the area want to be able to have access to the data, we have an agreement with both the state, because it includes case mix data, and um, Hopkins, that we will be able to give them access to the OMOP-based uh, data set. So now I'm going to hand it over to Andy. Uh, Andy's joined our team, uh, I think, earlier this year and has just done an amazing job. Uh, uh, I think he came like in the first two weeks of COVID or something. He can, he can correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, um, he's been doing an amazing job building out our CRISP Insights technology platform. So Andy, why don't you uh, talk a little about yourself and then tell us what you're going to talk about. So thanks, Ross. Um, yes, I joined CRISP in February and... Um, uh, I was asked um, to think about getting involved in a in a project that was going to do some work to analyze PDMP data and look at all of our logging so we could give responses back to users who said, how is my data being used? And um, 
at the second of the vendor presentation, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think you should run with this. So that's sort of how I got involved here. Mm. And it's been really fun. I'm hoping I can give you the story of something that sort of evolved and turned into a bunch of capabilities that we can use um, going forward. We haven't mastered everything, but one of the interesting things is because it's COVID, we had nothing on April the 13th when this project started. So I'd been uh, on board at Chris for probably about less than less than two months. And um, first time I've ever had to call a vendor and say, uh, can you do this project without us ever seeing you? Um, can you do this project for less money? And can we slide in a little minor scope change called COVID-19? So that's how it started. And um, I have to say, Phil, the, uh, who led the team for Slalom, he said, I wasn't quite sure about you initially because that was your first approach to me. And then we were supposed to kick off the project on the 13th and Lindsay, who many of you know Lindsay at Chris, she said, let's have a meeting on the Friday before the 13th, the kickoff day, just so we're clear on expectations. So that was the speed at which we launched this. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about technology. I, don't, I didn't want to dwell on technology. I wanted to talk about what we're able to get out of the technology. But let's talk a little bit about the technology. Um, we built all of this in, can you go back to the back of that one slide? Um, we built all this in uh, Microsoft Azure using technology called Azure Data Lake 2. So I think when we first talked about this, we said, oh, we want to build a data warehouse. We want to bring all that crisp clinical data in so that we can pull it together and get it out for uh, various use cases, including research. And our consultants said, you know, you really might want to think about a data lake. So there's this concept of a modern data architecture um, that, and the big difference is that the data lake has a lot more flexibility. It, it lets you load data. It, if the structure changes, it says, no problem. I'll just take those new columns. You drop a column, it says, no problem. Um, I can handle that um, without any difficulty. And it's a good idea when you don't really know exactly where you're going. And for this project, we really didn't know where we were going. We started very quickly and we were off to the races. Um, the technology on top of this is Spark and Databricks, uh, which allows you to create virtual tables uh, on top of this blob data in the Azure Data Lake. And the main thing is that the data as it pulls, pushes in is partitioned into multiple pieces so that when Databricks comes and wants to do a query, it can pull from all of this different blob data very, very quickly. Um, and it has a, an interface called Databricks uh, where you can run SQL type queries. Um, and it's to, to date, it's been very easy to transition users within CRISP into that, into that infrastructure. And obviously we can push stuff out to Power BI or other outputs. Um, but the big thing I want to talk about is really, this is sort of a, an incredible technology because the storage cost in Azure is relatively low. So we can take very large quantities of data. Initially, we were saying, why do we want to have copies of all of our ADTs, both a DNS in the, in the storage capacity there and in the insights capacity, in the insights warehouse. And I think once we looked at it, the cost to store it when it's compressed 10 to one is almost minimal. And you only pay for compute time when you spin up what's called a Databricks cluster, your virtual machine, if you like, to go do work in. So it actually says it's okay to store quite a lot of data that I might never touch and only, only pay when I spin it up and actually go use it. So it gives you that confidence that you can build a set of data together. And then we use another piece of technology called Azure Data Factory to basically schedule everything and make it run. So next slide, thanks. So definitely a quick start. Um, I think within three weeks, we had a working platform. And I think within six weeks, we were sending output to the Maryland Department of Health to support the COVID response. Initially, we took a, a daily confirmed cases file added things like race and ethnicity, chronic conditions that we were able to get from a combination of case mix data and other data within our environment. And we started sending uh, positives to um, MDH. I think within, I think probably by early June, we were starting to send positives hourly. So 
the Maryland contact tracing efforts spun up and they said, hey, we would like to get new cases. When you get the ELRs in uh, for the positive tests, we'd like you to process that and give it to us within an hour. We thought it was pretty um, uh, optimistic, um, but this platform actually proved its worth and we we're able to do exactly that, go query the the NEDS database that we have of all the tests and figure out who's new, newly positive in the last hour and shoot that over. So that's been, that's been fun. And then also because we're able to match at volume, we're able to support the CRS component of our business by matching large quantities of data and making sure that those EID matchings are up to date uh, and we can do that daily. Um, so the other things that have happened is the, the team we had went about looking at our historical data. We prioritized it based on the support for COVID and what came in. And now we've succeeded in bringing in nearly all the data you see under, under bullet point two, uh, including all of our logging data and other pieces. Um, and then we set about saying, each of these data sources needs to be kept up to date daily. So we've, we've got a set of production pipelines as we call them where every day we'll go back to that SQL database or we'll receive another file from one of those sources and it rolls it into the platform. It handles issues with deduplication and things coming in and you get this nice set of data that's ready for folks to wake up in the morning and say, I wanna run these queries or we want to do production queries to support MDH. And then you, you, as you can see under four, that quick start puts us in the place to go do a whole bunch more things. And I'm gonna to start to talk about those different use cases as we go through. So this is a lot of things on one chart and I'm looking for my pointer and I don't have it. Um, but uh, this is sort of a conceptual chart on the left are all of the data sources within CRISP. Some data sources outside of CRISP, right? So we're getting confirmed panels uh, as the second box down. Uh, but many of the other things in here are, are data that's, that's been flowing through CRISP, been available in the point of care um, application, uh, but not necessarily available in bulk. Some of these things were difficult to query because of the volume that was accumulated and actually, frankly, very difficult to roll into CRISP insights because of their volume and the way they were structured. But we've gotten past that and we're, we're moving forward. Uh, the other thing that CRISP Insights is able to do is uh, interface with that master patient index. As, as uh, Ross said, that's sort of the backbone of everything. Every lab, every diagnostic report, every ADT flows through that. And as, as, each, as each patient gets more hospital, hospital and clinical information, it uh, masters pulling it all together. So, and it continues to get better all the time. And it's, I'm, I'm like a huge fan. I didn't know anything about this technology. It's IBM Initiate, it's a third party technology, but it's tuned really well for this use case. And it solves issues where the first name and the last name are backwards. It solves issues where somebody uh, mistypes the date of birth. It knows if it's only one character off, it's probably the same person and goes ahead and pushes it through. And that's incredibly valuable when you're doing fast moving data for first tests. Um, the other piece we're able to reach out to is commercial APIs. So we've reached out to the Google API to standardize addresses. We've reached out to the census API to go ahead and get geocoding back. Uh, we've even, uh, we worked one day with DC and one of the engineers said, oh, I found a DC ward API. We, we've got the DC ward API working and the DC wards are flowing in. So that ability to connect outside is fantastic. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see that we can deliver to multiple different places to our uh, CRS, uh, you know, Tableau uh, dashboard repository, um, to Hopkins, where we're working on that research data. Um, you see there, you've got Maryland Department of Health and the DC Department of Health. There we're, we're pushing a whole bunch of different pieces, both detail and summary level information over to them every day. And then if you see there, we've got Maryland, the Maryland Salesforce, where they do the called COVID link, where they do where they handle the contact tracing. And then DC, we do that on a daily basis. We'll send over their stuff. But as you see on the right, there's a lot of scalability. We started um, 
and it was a, a, a reasonable number of tests. Now we're into the millions. Uh, we're obviously looking and saying, when's the scaling going to run out? We don't see it at this point, but um, you know, clearly we're going to get from 3 million to 6 million to 10 million quite quickly here. So we're looking at that roadmap as we go forward. Next slide. So let's talk about some actual use cases. And I'll start with the sort of the easy softballs that they throw us at the start, and then it gets increasingly more complicated. So um, I think our first effort was to try and match race and ethnicity. Um, the good news is we didn't have to figure it out. There are some very smart people at CRISP were um, working with multiple pieces of data and grabbing it with a SQL query and matching it in Excel and figuring it out. And after about six weeks, they're like, please, can you take this over and turn this into production? Um, and so we were fortunate. We were able to stand on their shoulders, write the code, and it was able to do it. And it's not just a straightforward thing. We're trying to get the optimal race and ethnicity. Um, so we've used the case mix for the first approach for, for in Maryland. But then we've enhanced it with two years of ADTs and come up with some clever logic that says if it's, if it's missing, for some ADTs, ignore that. Where I've got it positive, good. If I've got two of one type and two of another type, I'm probably going to have to say it's missing. But if I have a preponderance mm. of one race and ethnicity coding, then I can say I'm, I'm confident that that's it. And we've actually, I think, increased it by 10 to 15 percent uh, over just uh, regular race and ethnicity because we've been able to bring all those sources together. Um, and then we pushed on to sort of make that generically available. And so everybody says, Would you, we'd like this and can you serve it with race and ethnicity? So that's what we do. Um, the next thing on standardizing addresses, this started really early on because the contact tracing said we want a really good county and so we can send to the right people. And I said, oh, no problem. We'll just match the county by zip code. And they said, no, 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 no. All around the edge of Baltimore County, all around the edge of Baltimore City, uh, there's all sorts of overlap by zip code. And I'm like, okay, back to the drawing board. And we went and said, okay, we'll go ahead and try using Google. And fortunately, we, um, we didn't rack up too big a bill on Michael Berger's credit card account. Um, but we started off and we started pushing things through and we were able to get really good county information. And then the next ask was, hey, can you like strip out this apartments and units and everything so we got clean address so we can actually put households together? Um, can you do that for us? Uh, and so we were able to do that. That's a little bit part of Google st standardization as it is. Um, then we were able to go ahead and pull some geocoding in, um, mostly from the census API. Um, and then I think one of the things that we've done, which is sort of super helpful, is that we said, we're going at these APIs way too many times. Let's just store the results of going to the Google API and the census API for an address. And so we go ahead and store it. So we've, not, we've got something like, two and a half million unique addresses in Maryland, all Google matched and census matched. And so if we see that same address again, we can just go ahead and say, we got it. So that's, that's helpful and it actually saves a lot of costs. So, um, and then another piece that we did for COVID-19 is to figure out who was in a nursing home. We realized early that not everybody said, you know, um, XYZ nursing home, and the address, they just gave us the address. So we did a little bit of reverse engineering and figured out, okay, for those addresses, they are in the nursing home. And, uh, and then we built this set of standardized addresses, which then code for nursing homes, assisted living facilities, hospices, uh, correctional facilities. And now when we're, we're pushing that to um, contact tracing, they get, so this address actually is this nursing home and here's the contact number for this nursing home and here's the type. And I think that's really helped us focus um, so that people can, can work on specific outbreaks. Um, and then I think the last thing is back to the master patient index because we've got all this information from before. Um, even if they 
on their test, they provide one phone number usually or no phone number. Um, we're able to go ahead and supplement that for I think 30 or 40 percent of patients with additional home cell and work numbers that are very recent and that's that I think that has made the ability to contact goats go way high. Uh, next slide please. So here's an interesting one that we're involved in now is just supporting universities. Uh, so on the left they send us a roster. Uh, we go through um, each night we match it to our master patient index. Uh, we match it to the NEDS results or the lab results that came in that night. Um, and then we can push, um, at the moment we're pushing aggregate information that says for the last 21 days, on each day of the last 21 days, who was tested positive, who's tested negative, so that they can see for that student population what's happening. Uh, once we get HIPAA waivers in place, we're gonna be able to push back um, actual lab tests. And then obviously we can push through to COVID link and say, the students at UMBC, um, and that helps us to coordinate the, the response. Next slide. So let's, let's move uh, into research a little bit. Um, so with the, uh, the Hopkins COVID-19 research study, we're at the stage of having a fully developed 1,000 patient sample. And you may say, gosh, Andy, it's November. Uh, what are we doing? And But we've gone along a road here to say, let's specify this clearly. Let's figure out where our data sources are. And when we started this, we didn't have really good access to the case mix data from a diagnosis and procedure code point of view. And um, the, the researchers are like, OK, we actually need clear diagnosis and procedure code and using the OMAP model, we're gonna come up with uh, encounters and link, link everything to encounters. And so I think we've been able to work collaboratively with them and build out this as we've been able to bring in more data sources. And we're at a point now where um, I think we've got a really good map of those data sources and the outputs. So Hopkins is gonna give us their, uh, their clear feedback this week and then we're going to go ahead and push the button and to generate this for about 2.2 million Marylanders. So um, with all of, the, all of the sporting data. So um, very interesting, probably couldn't have done many of these things without having a data platform like this. Uh, you know, extracting lab data is actually quite difficult to do. So, and, but, and then matching it um, is, is quite complex, but the, the platform is really able to do a great job of taking many to many uh, joins and just bringing it back very quickly. So let me talk about um, an antibody serology study for COVID-19 that was run by MBH. They said to us, can you take these uh, results from six hospitals and can you just add gender, race, ethnicity, and some admission information and primary diagnosis information? so that we can, can fill out that data set for, for research. And we were able to turn that in two or three days, again, because we've had some of the experience from doing this for COVID, we're able to apply that to a research case. And then for PDMP, um, in support of one of the CMS quality measures, uh, we were able to pull specific PDMP data matched to Medicaid enrollment data um, and help build some measures and work with a work with a third party to develop a whole set and again deliver that de-identified data with you know patient keys that are not giving anything away so we're able to keep the pdmp data set intact but extract it in a in a relational way that can be used by researchers next slide I just want to point out with the PDMP, um, uh, that's a good example. And you mentioned two things back here. One, just Medicare data and or Medicaid data and the PDMP data. Um, we do have, you know, all of the data we're available that are available for research are limited by what rights we have to be able to share it. And the PDMP data, for example, until very recently, uh, there were no um, there were no legal um, opportunities for us to share. It was actually it was not available for research at all. Then le some legislation was passed in the Maryland uh, uh, in in the state of Maryland for 
making it available, but it's still taken a while for some of the ways that it would be available to, to be promulgated. And specifically, you couldn't, like, you couldn't get, a, you couldn't provide a patient list and say, give me the data on these patients, but you can get uh, a, a limited data set with the identified data eventually. And that's what he's working on. And um, there's been a huge ask for PDMP data for research. So I'm excited to see that part coming forward. And this just kind of speaks to the um, to how flexible this platform is because um, as you've rattled off the number of projects that you've, you and your team, Andy, have been able to um, do kind of on the fly uh, with this platform, it really, uh, having, having tried to do some of these projects in our production environment in the past, where um, it would just slow us down to no end to try to um, compete with making sure that nothing slowed our ability to provide data at the point of care. This is, since this is an offline, you know, it's, it's a separate data set. It doesn't impact our production uh, uh, space, which by the way, is also being, being moved to the cloud and is also experiencing this ability to scale um, in a way that wasn't possible before. But it's just, it's really uh, been impressive to see how complex the questions you can ask have, have become. And it doesn't, you know, my understanding is the, how Azure works on the, on the computing side is it just spins up another server for the 20 milliseconds that you need it or whatever it's gonna be to, to do that query. And you get your answers back, not in hours and days, but in moments. Is that, is that an accurate, uh, uh, understanding? It is. I mean, some moments are, are, are uh, multiple hours, but uh, <laughs> a lot of things come back extremely quickly. And certainly, I think you can join massive data sets and say, give me the first uh, 15 joins, and they come back in, in literally five seconds. Yeah. You, you're like, how did it do that? I'm not sure. So here's a, bit, a little bit of a picture of um, the data that's coming out for the Johns Hopkins research study. So you can see the in the middle of there, we've got a patient sample, and then the case mix visits data, and then the case mix procedures and diagnosis down the middle. Um, on the left, we've got the labs that connect to that, and we're obviously trying to match that to visit ID. And then on the right-hand side, we've got all the pieces that um, came from uh, NEDS, uh, electronic labs, testing for COVID, um, and the confirm cases panel that we get. So the composite of those two, uh, and we can build a set of uh, specific tests for this patient cohort. And that's just, here's what a limited data set looks like in pieces. Hmm. Okay, so um, a few more use cases. And um, yeah, I liked how you said it. Um, Ross, it's, we've been able to do things. I think it's been, um, we've been very fortunate that COVID's been here because I've had days where um, I felt like the production support's been fantastic, but sometimes I've got a priority and somehow I feel like the entire IT team is working for me. Yeah. And um, that's, been, that's been amazing. And hopefully we're, we're less expensive now that it's all set up and it's running and it's smooth. But I think we were we were a pest for a long time, saying, "Can we get that data? And can we get that data? And can we run that tonight for four hours and uh, hope the lights don't dim too much because we're trying to pull in three years of data?" Um, so hopefully we're moving to a place where we're very helpful, uh, both to CRISP and to the external community as we start to pull these pieces together. So a few more use cases just to give you good examples. Um, so hospitalization. Uh, I'm not going to take any credit for this. This is uh, uh, Katie Talley uh, at CRISP and uh, several people who've worked with her on the ENS side have really driven to come up with accurate hospitalization information. And it's based on the, the real-time ADT information we're getting, but they built a visit algorithm that's, that's really tightly pulled together those ADTs into prescribed visits. Uh, and then we've been able to match that uh, for what we call qualifying COVID hospitalization. So uh, when somebody's positive, either 
seven days before or up to 28 days after they're hospitalized, we count that as a qualifying hospitalization. And we're able to match that um, and send a report to MBH. The other side of it is we've actually been able to update that daily. So each morning we send a file to contact tracing and if somebody was in the hospital, uh, it would have had an admission date and um, uh, where they were. And um, the next day they get discharged, it'll say, no, they're not in the hospital anymore. They've been discharged. So we're actually able to flow fairly real-time information. I guess it's a, a day behind, but fairly real-time information to assist uh, folks looking, uh, trying to interact with that patient. Um, so new projects coming up, talking about developing pre-diabetes flags. And this is where we're digging into the, into the treasure chest. Um, we're gonna utilize the lab data. We're gonna utilize some claims data and we've got to figure out what that looks like. We, we've not mastered claims data from a, from a technical point of view. I think where we've gotten to though is for the data lake. If we can get um, encounter information with diagnosis and procedure code, and a few other pieces of information that are really targeted at that clinical analysis and not necessarily cap targeted at everything in the final claims uh, type piece, we can be very successful. Um, trying to get everything in that claim record together, I think we're going to try and leave to the people who do that for a living and spend all their time doing it. And we want to try and uh, get a feed that uh, gives us some of that information. I think this is where you need to be really careful, Andy, because it's like that that children's book. If you give a mouse a cookie, you know, once once people know that you're able to do these things, you're you're going to find an unlimited number of requests. So it'll be really good to uh, figure out how to manage that going forward. Uh, it's, research. it's already challenging. Uh, everybody wants to be at our backlog meeting. <laughs> so. Um, Let's talk about sort of a summary of the capabilities and then we can get to talking a little bit about uh, the future. So matching against the master patient index of this EID, we're able to do that very quickly. We're able to run it um, actually with multiple threads so we can actually match uh, things very quickly. Uh, we actually had a, a new use case the other day that they asked us to match 12 million uh, individual records for a, for a use case and we were able to do that within three days. Um, uh, like I said, we're sending those match files every day with 3 million records. And I think those are, those are getting produced in about 20 minutes uh, doing that complete matching. Uh, the rapid querying here, I think this is the power. Uh, there's no indexes, it's sort of like magic. I mean, I've, I've had years doing database work and I've always had to figure out how to do performance tuning and. Um, you know, make sure you're, you're not, cross, you're not uh, crossing over with somebody else using it for production use. And all of a sudden it's like magic. I yeah. connect two things up and the answer comes up and it doesn't say you don't have an index. This is going to take forever. It just comes back. So that's some of what's going on here. And it's making me think about all that experience with databases is all for naught because when you get into this world, I mean, clearly it's helpful so you can architect it well, but once you're in this world, you actually don't have to think about those things, which is really fun. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, flexibly accepting a new column or drop column, that's been amazingly helpful. This has happened all the time. Uh, we're getting feeds from different people and they say, oh, by the way, did you see those three extra columns that we slipped in last Tuesday? And we're like, yep, we saw those. What do you want us to do with them? <laughs> and um, but then we can we can react fairly quickly and include that into the use case. Nice. Um, and then in terms of figuring out how to get to this production system, um, I think that's the biggest thing. And all the hard work done in the last six months was to bring in the historical data and then figure out how to pull it in every day. And um, we've gotten to some remarkably consistent uh, data sets now. Um, Clearly we haven't mastered everything. There, there's holes and there's, you know, the data is the data, it's, it's healthcare data. Um, but I feel like we've gotten to a, a really good place. Next slide. Right. So future, I've just got a couple of things here. And I think it's really, um, like Ross said, it's like, you know, uh, don't tell too many people because um, they'll all want a piece of this. 
But I think we can be more expansive in our thinking about what's possible. I think we would tend to try and do things a little bit smaller. I think now we can ask the question, is that possible? And really my first question is, do we already have the data or not? And if I already have the data, getting there and giving it to an analyst and then coming up with some good information is reasonably quick. If I don't have the data, there's a sort of a three to four week lag time to get that through and get that process, get the historical data in and, and then start updating it daily. So that's some of that. And then obviously new challenges. Um, that's one thing that we are able to do. I think there are challenges with the data that we have, the way it's processed, um, and then looking to the future, our integration with fire um, into the fire repositories and into other pieces that we can do. But I think in month six, uh, this has been a really fun ride and um, we're starting to create repeatable pieces, which is so we're not just building another new ad hoc query, we're able to build things with uh, parameters so you can, you can actually run uh, a use case with different dates and different sources and different pieces so that uh, we're beyond just the, uh, the straight ad hoc capability. So that's good. So normally I would say any questions and I guess uh, this is uh, yeah, and, and you, I, over to you. I, I think uh, I think you highlighted this this idea and, and what how I want to tie this back into the, the research uh, evolution for us. Um, just like Initially, when we first did our first uh, delivery of, of uh, data access for researchers, every one of those new uh, requests took us way more time than an effort than the fourth and fifth one. Um, and to your point about building kind of modules of, yes, we can do this. In fact, we have an archetypal query that we've built that we just have to change the ICD-10 codes that we're asking about uh, so we can look up patients with a certain di group of diagnosis set and swap out some facility types and, and go after just hospitals or just EDs or s some, other, some other thing or long-term care facilities. And you can just by changing those parameters uh, ask the same thing. And so even though in our research, while we do have this you know, cost recovery model, just like we've been able to leverage a lot of the CRISP reporting services reports for research, um, it will be clear that over time, we'll be able to uh, leverage more of these built queries and built capabilities to say, it's not gonna take three weeks for us to, you know, to, to design and deploy in QI a, a query. We're going to be able to say, yeah, we've done this a bunch of times now for these other uses, for these public health uses. We can just optimize it for your request, and that takes hours, not days. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really thinking that this is going to be ultimately pretty cost effective for folks. Any comment about that, Andy? You, you want to nod or you want to? Yeah, no, I think um, definitely the, I think as we master the data, I think that ability to start to, to create repeatable pieces, and I think even to say, we'll create repeatable data sets that are available quarterly, I think is a feasible thing too. And st I'm starting to think in that realm. Yeah. Obviously we need to match to what the needs are, but I do think we can get to the place where instead of it being ad hoc, it ends up being, so as we're building the research studies, we're saying, how can we make sure this is reusable? so that the next time we, we go down this path, we can uh, quickly adapt it to be successful. Yeah, um, that's, that's excellent. I just, uh, this last slide I have is, is really about how you do this. Um, you know, go to the website, look up the CRISP Research Initiative under services. Um, you could, there's forms there that you can fill out uh, to request data. I'll help you put together a cost estimate for it. We review it. We put together your um, data use agreement and deliver data. Um, but and and all a lot of these projects, especially for researchers who haven't worked with this before, um, they need um, maybe a little guidance for me. And, and I, I'm on the phone all the time with folks uh, to help help them get this together. So I'm happy to be on the phone with any of you. I'm going to stop sharing now and just say um, you know thank you so much for listening to us. Um, you can reach out to ross.martin at chrishealth.org or Andy 
hanks at chrispelf.org to get either one of us uh, to answer your questions. Thanks so much for the time. Uh, we hope this has been useful to you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. This recording will be available through the conference portal until Tuesday, November 17th, after which time all videos will be posted to the CRISP website. Because this presentation has been previously recorded, please send any questions you may have via email to annualconference at crisphealth.org.